On this episode of Shit I Learned the Hard Way, that time I locked every employee of a big three automaker out of their desktops. The 90s were really the wild west of IT. A lot of people don't remember, but back then the average user had to log into multiple systems all over. They had AS400s, mainframes, Unix systems, Windows desktops. They were starting to see the first web applications appear. And, and this was a big problem because a lot of people had to remember multiple logins for multiple systems. So the average user would have somewhere between 12 to 15 applications that they had to log into each individual application every single day. Making it worse was there was no consistent password policy, meaning like oftentimes a password you use for one app wouldn't meet the password requirements for another app. And so for the average user, this was a real mess. You had to log in multiple times a day. This was a cost to a lot of businesses because they had to constantly reset passwords, constantly enforce new policies, deal with issues relating to password security because people like to write them down quite a bit. Well, I was fortunate. I worked for the first company that came out with a ubiquitous single sign-on solution that solved this very, very complex problem. And in fact, one of our major customers was one of the big three automakers. Now, this system was really interesting. It actually eliminated the need for any user to know their password, which meant all passwords could be changed to these really nice, highly secure passwords. And they just had to know one password. Logging in with that one password got you into every single application you had to use. And so there I was working on this project right before it went live live, meaning like it had been live for a few users, but we were about to turn the entire thing on for everyone. All we had to do to do so was change a configuration file on a Unix system. And that change meant that everyone would be live into this brand new world of single sign-on. Now, if you've never worked with a union IT shop before, there's some things you should know. Usually the roles are really, really restricted and they're broken down into very small sphere of control. In fact, there was one person at this company whose job it was, was to restart services or reboot servers. And that's really important to this story because there I was making the final go live configuration change on a file. And there was that one person, that one guy who could restart and reset services, who was very impatiently waiting on me to make this change because he had an appointment and had to leave and go to his appointment. And so there I was rushing, there he was pressuring, there I was rushing, there he was pressuring. I made the change. He restarted the services, walked out the door, got in his car, and went to his appointment. All of us were sitting there in our little broom closet, which acted as our office, high-fiving each other. Everything was live, except we noticed something. Out of the corner of our eye, the phone calls started coming in. And in these old phone systems, they had a row of lights that ran up sort of the, the left-hand side of the phone so you could see how many phone calls were in the queue. And we watched as every light on the phone started to light up on our main line. Then we watched as the secondary line, every light started to light up on the secondary line. Never a good sign. So we picked up the phone and found out that as that change had gone live, we had locked every single user out of their desktop. And since no one knew their passwords anymore, not being able to get into the systems and get into their desktop meant they had no access to anything. They could not log into any systems, any servers, any applications whatsoever. So what do you do? Well, here we are, we're stuck. The one person that can restart services has gone on a personal appointment. And I pulled up the file, looked at it, sure enough, typo, just a stupid typo. So I fixed the typo quickly and we started running around to find someone who could restart all of the services. Here's the problem. Again, union IT shop, the one guy on shift that could do it was gone. So in a panic, we started trying to come up with an alternate solution to the problem and we came on to an idea. While restarting services was owned by one person, there was a separate person whose job it was to wire in the power to all of the servers. And we happened to know which server was the one that was misconfigured. So what we ended up having to do was go to the power guy and persuade him to disconnect the power from that server 
and reconnect the power to that server, effectively forcing a restart and restoring normalcy to the entire system. So after doing that, of course, everything then worked, things were happy, but for 30 minutes of that day, and it was the first 30 minutes of that day, no one could log in to their desktops. So what did we learn? Well, if you're listening to this story, the first thing that probably struck you was lesson number one. Why? Why in the world was I making production changes to a production server? Why was I doing that in production? And that, that's ridiculous. And, and all of us can agree that that's ridiculous. That's not the way we should do things. But it actually showcases a secondary problem, which is the more important problem. Well, it's a similarly important problem. How about that? And that's this. We had no backup plan. You see, we had no ability to back out changes. We had no ability to correct ourselves. Not only that, the honest truth is we hadn't really thought through the what ifs. We haven't really thought about what happens if a configuration change fails and no one's there to make the change or help us restart servers. We hadn't thought through any of those sorts of things. We hadn't really done a true fault analysis and looked at what would happen if that one server was unavailable and that people weren't able to log in. And that's a bigger problem and one that's really, really, really important. So the valuable lesson in this is this. Yes, don't make changes to production environments direct. That's dumb. But the more important thing is to really take a moment and think through fault trees. Think through all of the things that could go wrong and spend some time trying to understand how you would go about resolving issues should they occur at each of those fault points. That's the actual really important piece of this. Nowadays, we're better about this with change in configuration management, but let's be honest. All of us know that not every company implements this well, and we continue to see problems over and over again of misconfigurations getting pushed, systems shutting down, things not working the way they're supposed to work. So it's really important that we take the time to make sure that we're being methodical. This is a place where documentation helps. Knowing exactly how to do, having a run book, a playbook, having those things defined in a clear way that show the fault tree, show what can possibly go wrong and show how to resolve each of those fault issues is a critical, critical part of running an effective and efficient IT shop. But here's the thing. Here's lesson number three. You would think I would have learned my lesson. You would think I would never make that mistake again. But here's the problem. As you start to get more senior in your career, you start to look at those things as things that apply to other people, to new people, to people who aren't as experienced as you. You develop a little bit of hmm, age arrogance, I guess you could call it. You think that you know better than other people and that rules don't apply to you. And I say that because it wasn't 10 years later when I did the same exact thing again. I made a configuration change in a, productive in a production environment that actually shut people out of their desktops again. Why? Arrogance. So the lesson here is this. Just because you're senior, just because you're more experienced, doesn't mean you're not prone to error. Take the time, check yourself, make sure everything you're doing is following the process. Written checklists are a good thing. I don't care how far you are in your career. I hope this is helpful to you. I hope it helps you think about how to make changes methodically, how to have a backup plan, how to know how to reverse changes in case of an emergency or in case of a critical issue. And more importantly, I hope it shows that it doesn't matter how long and how far along you are in your career, following the rules, following step-by-step -step checklists is just as valuable to someone who's been doing it for 20 years as it is to someone who's been doing it for one or two years. Thanks again. I hope this is interesting to you. Please subscribe if it is. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next episode.